I will be sharing with you uh, the Word of God from uh, Genesis chapter 12, uh, verses 1, 2, and 3. Genesis 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in, all, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Amen. Amen. And, you know, we've been uh, talking about <clears throat> the abundant life. Uh, abundant life revisited is our series. And, you know, last week, Pastor Cami shared about how God, uh, in his abundance, uh, infinite supply of his love and his grace, of his power, of his faithfulness, he gives to us generously. And so, you know, we really need to hold on to this definition that when we say an abundant life, it's not having more than others. It's not having uh, an infinite amount of supply for me to use and for me to indulge in. Uh, but abundant life that Bible talks about is our ability to share, to give generously in times of need. When you see people broken, hurting, uh, when you see people in need of God's love, in need of the reality of God and His presence, that we are able to give, we are able to share, we are able to serve, and we are able to draw near. And so, you know, one of the uh, verses that really clearly describes this uh, is uh, Philippians 4:19, uh, where Paul says, And my God will supply every need of yours, according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And so, you know, the two words that stick out are supply and riches, right? Because it is according to his riches that God will supply our every need. And so the first word that uh, supply in, in Greek is plerose. And, you know, the first part of that word, P-L-E, you know, it, it, it means to fill to the maximum, to be uh, abundant in number and in volume. So, you know, that's where we get the words like plentiful, right? Like, you know, when you have a lot. And so w when God says, when Paul says God will supply you, doesn't mean that God will give it to you in a stingy manner, like God will barely let you scrape by. But no, it is an abundance filling to the max. You know, I used to work at my dad's gas station. And, you know, during the energy crisis, like, some people would come, and you know, back in those days, people would drive these huge V8s that gets like eight miles per gallon, you know, just gas guzzlers. And then they would like dig through the pockets and they'd be like, 75 cents, please. And in my mind, like, where are you going to go with this gas? <laughs> You're there, but that's all they have 75 cents, you know, uh, and that's not God. God is not giving you 75 cents, like half a gallon of gas in the gas guzzler that, you know, we're driving in. No, He says, fill it up, fill it to the max. Whatever you need and beyond, I will supply. And where is this supply coming from? Supply coming from a uh, Greek word, plutos. And it's the you know, same <clears throat> PLE that we have where it is uh, a word that describes riches, wealth, uh, and abundance. You know, and whether it's materially, spiritually, emotionally, what God is able to give to us is out of his riches. And he gives accordingly, right? And, and so we need to understand, like, you know, like, I don't know, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos like, is supposed to be the billionaire. And so out of the billions of dollars he has, out of it, he can give you a dollar. Out of it, he can give you five bucks. But see, if he were to give accordingly, According to the billionaire status that he has, like if he came to a, you know, I don't know, worthy cause and, you know, like fighting for justice or, you know, helping the impoverished, he says, according to my wealth, I'm going to donate $100 million, you know, $200 million. See, that's giving accordingly to his status, to his stature, to his wealth. And so God doesn't give simply out of, you know, out of an abundance of what he has. He says, here's a dollar. Scrape by with this. 
make ends with. No, God says, I will give accordingly, as rich as I am, as I have an infinite supply, as Pastor Tammy talked about. Our God is an abundant God. His grace, His mercy, His love, His forgiveness is infinite. He will not run out of this supply. See, our God's supply is infinite. And this world operates in the concept that, no, everything we have is finite. So therefore, I must hold on to what I have. I must make sure that I have enough. You know, uh, if people ask me, you know, what, what is your hobby? You know, I, I used to have two hobbies, right? Fishing and camping. Uh, I don't go camping as much anymore because, you know, Hannah betrayed me and betrayed the boys. She's, she declared she no longer wants to go camping. She wants to go to hotels, and so it's like, can't do it. Uh, I, I go fishing every once in a while, and, and it's so seldom now. And, you know, I feel like I lost my touch. I, I, you know, I don't catch as many fit, as much fish as I used to. And if you were to ask me, like, you know, what was your highlight of your fishing career, you know, maybe 16, 17 years ago, I know, a long time ago, right? Uh, Hannah, let me go on a... Uh, Two night, three day uh, fish, uh, tuna fishing trip uh, out of HM Landing, San Diego, right? And that was like the highlight. The seas were really rough. You know, I was like seasick and vomiting the whole time, but fishing was amazing, right? Uh, I caught nine tunas and two yellowtails. And you know, there's like different grades of tuna. You know, the best is the bluefin tuna, and there's the big eye tuna. And then yellow, yellowfin tuna, that's okay. And then albacore is right there. So albacore is like what they use actually to like put into like canned tuna and cat food. <laughs> you know, anyway, but it's still pretty good. But I caught nine. I caught nine tuna and two yellowtail. You know, when you go to a Japanese restaurant, the hamachi, that's my favorite. I caught two of that. And uh, even though I filled my icebox, I still wanted to catch more. And there were guys who were, you know, like just so good at fishing. They caught twice as much, like three times as much than me. Like some of them caught like 30 tuna. It was a crazy, crazy tuna trip. And you would think I would be satisfied because I caught nine tunas and two yellowtails. No, I was jealous. I was like, ah, I wish I caught 15. I wish I caught 20. How come I only caught nine? And then I come home. And so, you know, I'm so proud of my catch, and I call my parents, I call my brothers, call my friends, and I start, you know, filleting them and giving them out. But nine tunas and two yellow, that's a lot of fish, guys. That's a lot of fish that you cannot consume. And if you start cooking tuna, and you might as well, like, eat it out of a can because it doesn't taste that good. You have to eat it as sashimi, you know? And so after a while, I ran out of people to give to. So I was giving it to my neighbors and just throwing it to cats. I, I didn't need that much. But I remember that feeling of desperation on the boat, trying so hard. Like, I wanted to make it 10. I wanted to make it double digits. Like I, I want more. You know, I was coveting, even though I didn't need that much fish. And it, it, it's... Because I forget, I tend to forget that even though God operates out of a system of unlimited supply of His grace and His mercy and His kindness, I tend to stay in this realm of the world's uh, operation, world system. This world operates from this limited supply. There's only so many things and so much supply, and you got to make sure uh, that you get yours. That's how this world operates. And if you fall into that trap, you always are trying to get more and make sure that you have. See, by faith and by generous living, we can choose to live from God's riches in glory instead of always fearful, always worrying, always thinking that I do not have enough. And that is why in 1 Timothy uh, 6, 6, Paul says, there is great gain in godliness with contentment. There is great gain in godliness with contentment. And, you know, Paul is talking about learning and uh, being trained 
to be content in the situation that God has allowed you to be in and not setting a standard where if I don't meet this standard, then I am not happy, that I am not satisfied. You know, uh, I remember when I was in college, you know, all of us, we were poor, you know, and, and you know, we're barely scra scraping by every month. And, you know, we, we used to be like so bad. Like, you know, when we were like juniors, we would like coax the freshman girls like, hey, let's go eat, you know, lunch together at this Togo's, Togo Subway shop. And then so you order, you know, and then so she would order her sandwich and then we would throw in our buy one, get one free coupon. And, you know, and she's like, you use me. It didn't, it didn't cost you any money. Come on. We're just trying to, you know, <laughs> have a lunch here. You know, uh, it just didn't have enough. And, and we always compared like. Uh, what I had versus what other people had, instead of learning the beauty and the secret and the joy of being content with God would allow us to have. And when you don't have this contentment, being spiritually content with God's presence in your life, with God's love for you, with his forgiveness and with his grace and mercy that surrounds you, we fall into this temptation of just always coveting. And, you know, covetousness uh, is desiring something so badly that you would lose your contentment in God, that you are willing to sacrifice your relationship with God, your love for God, in order to get what you think you really need or you really want. You know, we, we see this. Sometimes we don't think this way, but in our actions, this is what we choose. You know, sometimes you, instead of coming to church, instead of, you know, just staying in fellowship with your community, you know, you're working overtime, you, you know, you, you don't have time to read the Bible because you got to keep working and working and, you know, preparing. Uh, what are you doing? Oh, like, you're like, oh, I'm just trying to catch up. I'm just trying to make sure that you know, I don't fall behind. But in reality, because you want something so badly, you're willing to sacrifice friendship. You're willing to sacrifice worship. You're willing to sacrifice your time with the Lord in order to get what you want. And so in reality, what is happening is you're trading in your intimacy, your love for God, your community, so that you can get what your flesh is crying out, whether it's financial security, you know, whether it's positional, uh, you know, vertical upward movement, you know, whatever the case may be. I want you to understand something. God loves us. And because he loves us, he's promised to take care of us. And if you go to Genesis chapter 1, it is the account of God creating the universe. And how God creates the light. And God, how he separates the earth and the sky. And he starts to create, you know, the, the, the trees and the fish and the animals and all these things. And after each day, after each creation, what does God say? What does the Bible say? It says, it was good. It was good. But God does something so different after he creates man. Right in verse 26 of Genesis 1, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Verse 28, after creating man, look what he does. Verse 28, and God blessed them. Boom, right there. Every other living creature, God just said, oh, it's good. I like it. I like what I did. But when he created man in his own image, as soon as he created the man, and Adam didn't get to say a word, Adam didn't get to do one righteous act, Adam didn't get to need you know, fall down and worship God or do anything that would bring pleasure to the Lord. But just upon completion of creating man, God says, I bless you. I bless you. 
This is the very first thing God did to us when we were created. Before we had any chance to show our allegiance, our faithfulness, our worship or service, God says, I bless you. This is our Father's heart for us. God wants to bless us. And it is his desire that we not only are blessed by God, but by being blessed by God, we become blessings ourselves. You know, and so that is the invitation to abundant life. What good is it if you have everything you want in this world, materially, positionally? You have all this wealth, and you have all these accolades. But if you don't have anybody to love, if you don't, anybody, if you don't have anybody that you serve or care about, if you don't have a community that you belong to. God says, I'm going to bless you so that you will become a blessing. And I'm going to bless you in such a way and use you in such a way that through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. See, this is the ultimate goal of God blessing us. What is our goal when we say, God, bless me? What is our desire when we say, God, I wish you would bless me more? Bigger house, better car, more spending budget, more toys? Is that why we want God's blessing? Or do we desire the blessings of God and do we desire to be his blessing, to be that channel of blessing so that through our lives, his blessings would flow into other lives that God has placed around us? We need to understand that when God blesses us, his purpose is that through his blessing, we become a blessing ourselves. And through that, God wants us to become a channel through which other people would bless us. And this is the abundant life. This is how it is defined in the Bible. Are you a millionaire? Are you a billionaire? But when you see needs, your heart is unmoved. You're like, what I have is mine. I, you're not getting a penny from me. I will not give you a penny because I don't know you. I don't like you. Your heart is hardened. How much money you have in your bank account has nothing to do with whether you're generous or not. You know, if you look at church finances, if you look at givers of the church, do you think the richest people give the most offering? No. Generous people usually don't make that much money. Generous people are just average Joes. You know, they just make Decent money, but when they see a need, their heart goes out. When they see somebody in need, when, it, when they see someone crying, when they see someone in need of help, they're like, how can I help? How can I be your friend? How can I be your neighbor? It may not be much, but hey, I have 20 bucks. Can I give it to you? I just have the sandwich. Can I share it with you? Are you a generous person? Are you a person who loves to share what God has blessed you with? Or are you in that state of coveting because you just don't think you have enough? Do you think if you're not generous, generous now and you, you have a half a million dollars in your bank account, do you think when you have $2 million in your bank account, you'll become generous? I bet you you won't. A generous person will always be generous, whether you have a million dollars in your bank, $50 in your bank, $2 in your pocket, you'll always be generous. To be generous means you understand your calling in life, that God has called you to be a blessing. God has called your life that through you, his blessings would flow. And you know, in Malachi 3.10, and it's a verse that is often misunderstood and misused. You know, many pastors use it to, like, really demand, you have to tithe. And if you tithe, this is the blessing, you know, that God will give you. But, you know, God is really expressing his heart and 
his richness, how God wants to just powerfully pour out his supply so that we can live a life of blessing. You know, let me read it to you. Malachi 3.10, it says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. And so that's the type of blessing that God wants us to experience every day. I don't know if you've ever been to Niagara Falls. You know, it, it, it is an amazing sight. The volume of water that just pours out. Uh, it, it's amazing how much water there is. And, you know, that's like the picture. God says, if I open the windows of heaven and allow this deluge of his blessing to pour out into us so that it would overflow. And that is the focus, that he would overflow, that God would give us enough so that we would be able to share. This is abundant life. Our abundant life in God is that it's not that we have enough to use for ourselves, but our abundant life is that God causes our lives to overflow as a blessing into the lives of those around us. And so, you know, this morning the main text talks about how God wants to do that, and he says to Abram, hey, first thing you need to do is to leave. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house. You need to leave your old way of life. You need to leave this world's paradigm of how to be content, how to be generous. This world will tell you, you can be generous when you have enough. You can be generous when your storehouses are full. Right? And God says, I want you to leave that kind of uh, paradigm. I want you to leave that mindset because that mindset will always lead you into thinking, I don't have enough. I must gather more for myself. And you end up becoming very, very stingy person. And God says, no, leave your old way of thinking. Leave your old standard of life and go to the land that I will show you, what God will show us, what God will teach us, what God will cause us to experience and encounter again and again, that our supply is not something we have to store up, but our supply comes directly from our Heavenly Father, who is rich and abundant in His limitless glory and love for us. I am all about, you know, preparing for your retirement and having a savings account and living wisely. Yes, we should do that. But if your only paradigm is this world's paradigm that you must have more in order to be generous, you must accrue all this wealth before you can be generous, you're being misled. You're being lied to. Even if you don't have what feels like enough, you can always share. It could come in a form of a hand draped around someone's shoulder who's hurting. It can be come in a form of a tear that you shed praying for and praying with somebody who's going through painful times. It can come in a form of your time being spent listening, communicating, sharing. Your emotions, your time, your talents, your heart, all these resources God has given to us, we can share so richly. And God will make sure that his supply will always cause us to overflow. And secondly, God tells Abram that you will be a blessing. 
I, I think this is such a challenge. To how many people in your life right now do you think you are a blessing? To your doorman, to your coworkers, to your friends, to your family members, to strangers and New Yorkers in Manhattan. To how many people are you a blessing? I think that's a good question to ask. You know, I can say, oh, I'm a blessing to my sons. I'm a blessing to my wife, hopefully. But is that it? Even heathens do that. Even heathens do that. But what about strangers? What about people who, like, really, that you, it, it's so evident that they need help. They need encouragement. Are we a blessing to them? What about your coworkers? What about your neighbors? In that apartment that you live in, are you a blessing? Are you living the life of abundance, life that shares, life that has good, kind, godly influence, a life that is able to love, able to embrace, able to forgive, able to heal? You know, in what ways? Are we being a blessing? In what ways are we touching the lives of those around us with what God has given to us? And so Apostle, uh, <clears throat> Apostle Paul, he talks about this, right? In, in that uh, God has richly, uh, supplied us with all that we would need. And this supply is an unlimited supply. And this supply will not run out just because you gave. But it's like a well that continues to spring out. You know, it's not contained in a jar. It's not contained in a bottle. Like I only have one gallon, and if I pour this out, that's it. No, it comes from a spring so that when you draw the water from the spring, it comes back up. It fills back up, and you pour it out, and it fills back up because God's system is it operates out of a limitless supply of his love, of his goodness, of his kindness. Unless you are generous, unless you are giving, unless you are serving, unless you, you are loving, you will not experience that. And so God calls upon Abraham that you will be a blessing and ultimately every nation will be blessed through you. Right? The calling on Israel was that they would become a conduit by which other people can tangibly experience the love of God and the power of God. But they totally missed this. They totally misunderstood this, right? They said, we are the chosen people. We are God's people. We are the holy nation. And everybody else is trash. Everybody else is damned to hell. They're dirty. They're unclean. We do not want to associate with them. You know, we are the only people who are chosen by God. Is that what God said? No. God told Israel that you have to be the light to all the nations. God told Abraham that through you, all the peoples, all the nations, all the families on earth will be blessed. Come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Are you a loving brother or sister to fellow Christians around you? That's good. But we need to do better. We need to do more. We need to be a loving neighbor. That's what Jesus said. He says, I sum up all the commands in these two commandments. Love the Lord your God with everything that you are. And the second is like that. It's just as important that you love your neighbor as yourself. Who is our neighbor? Well, Jesus explained that in that parable of the Good Samaritan. A Samaritan is somebody who was despised and looked down by the Israelites. 
Yet when this Israelite was robbed and injured and dying, the Levite, the high priest, they would not touch this guy. But the Samaritan went out of his way. He emptied his pockets. He poured everything that he had into saving this stranger's life. And then Jesus asked, who is your neighbor? Are we being that neighbor? Are we being that good Samaritan? You know, it's about loving. It's about serving. It's about reaching out. Even if it means it will give you no reward, no benefit in return. You know, some people get tired of serving and they say, I, I did so much. I helped so much. And they didn't even say thank you. I think that's how you burn out when you expect the people you serve to turn around and thank you. No, God will thank you. God stores up treasures and rewards for all that you've done in heaven. Don't worry about it. It's not going to get lost. It's not going to get deleted. It's not going to get stolen. God keeps record of all that you do. You don't have to feel bad that somebody didn't thank you when you helped them. Because God knows. And Jesus has promised that God, even if you give a water, a cup of water to a little boy, he will reward you. And that will not be forgotten. Don't serve with the intention that, well, if I help you, then you're going to scratch my back, right? You're going to kind of thank me and recognize what a good person I am. And when they don't do that, we get discouraged, like, oh, such an ingrate. No, that really kills your spirit of loving. That really kills your spirit of being abundant if you expect something in return. No, don't expect that. But just serve, just love, just be the channel of blessing. See, a channel of blessing means a from a higher source, higher position, say like a volume of water will flow down. See, that's the work of a channel. It, it channels it downward. And when the blessing is flowing downward through the channel that is you, do you think something can come up against that channel to say thank you? No, that is not expected. You're just expected to continue to give, continue to share, continue to bless. But in that act of continuously allowing the blessing of God to flow through the channel that is you, what is happening to you? That channel is constantly, continuously, being filled with the blessings of God as it flows out of you and flows through you. This is the abundant life. This is how our lives are to be. And I want you to know as difficult and painful as times are right now, this is such an opportune time for us to be that source of blessing. You know, when everybody's doing well, everybody has money, everybody's okay, that lunch you buy, that dinner party you throw, it's like, eh, it's nice. But you know, you know, when everyone's hurting, when everyone's struggling, yet during that time, you rise up to be a servant, you rise up to be an encourager, you rise up to be a friend, it goes a long way. It makes a lasting impact in the lives of those who receive that love, receive that blessing. Yes, we can all say, but right now I need it more. I, I am in such need. I know. I understand that. And with what little you have left, like the widow's might, it may not be much, what little you have. And God, I don't have much. I, I haven't worked in months. And I don't even know if I will be employed in, you know, in the next coming season. I don't have much. But I have the widow's might. I have two copper pennies. That's all I have. I just have a moment to spare. 
I just have a few drops of tears to shed. But I want to be generous with this. I want to serve with this. I want to love with this. I want you to know it's during times like this where you can powerfully make an indelible mark in someone's life by touching them with God's love, God's grace, God's kindness. People of God, I can't emphasize enough the genuine definition, biblical definition of abundant life. It's not having things so that everything around you is plentiful. That's not abundant life. Abundant life is that you are able to give and share and love generously no matter what season of life you're in. We're all going through a time of difficulty right now. And even during the season of difficulty, we are called to be generous. We are, we are called to live an abundant life. We are called to be a blessing. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. I want to ask you that same question. To whom are you being a blessing right now? And in this life that you are going through right now, this season, are you living a generous, abundant life? And if you think you're not, what would change that? How can God change that? And I'm going to tell you right now, it's not an infusion of a lot of money that's going to change that. No amount of money can help you become generous. Let's draw near to the Lord. And... Um, Let's remember this call that God wants us to be a blessing. And his desire is that through us, all the peoples on earth will be blessed. And let's pray that we can really live that life, that generous, abundant life, because God's love for us is abundant and limitless. Let's pray together.
Father God, we come before you. And Lord, as we embrace this passage that Paul declared to the church of Philippi, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Father, how we quickly forget that you supply our every need according to your riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Lord, may we not buy into the definition and expectation of this world of how to be happy, how to be filled. But Lord, we want to remember that you are God, that in your supply, you always cause an overflow. And you're a God in supplying our needs. Your resources are limitless. And so, Lord, may we look and may we desire to be generous people as you have been so generous with us, as you have not spared even your Son to love us, to forgive us, and to redeem us. Lord, no matter what season we're going in, that we learn to be generous people of God. May we live out this calling of being the channel of blessing that you have called us to be. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we cry out to you. Lord, that we will not demand to be filled first before we can be generous. But that we would experience and learn that as we start to live generous lives, that there will be a constant outpouring, overflow, supply of all that we need to be a blessing that you have called us to be. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.